right, so now we're going to look at section 15.3, which is triple integrals. Really, it's just an extension of what we've been talking about with double integration. Our goals today are to visualize triple integration, to compute triple integration over a box, and a statement of Bubini's theorem for triple integration, to find volumes of solids of in R3, and interchanging the order of integration in triple integration. So let's start by some motivating theory. Our motivating example, let's say we have an object with variable density. Um, and the density, uh, apparently this is convention, is to use a row here, that the density depends upon where you are in three-dimensional space. So we have some object here, and over here it might be really sort of relatively dense, and here it's less dense. And what we want to do is find the mass of this object. What is mass? Mass is just mass is equal to density times volume. But the problem is that each little piece in this has a different density, right? So what I'm thinking of when I do triple integration is I take out like one little piece within here, one little tiny dx dv dy box, dx dy dz box. And I calculate what is the density for this tiny little box. And then I sum up all of the densities over the whole object, and that gives me the total mass. Right? And so what I, what I write that in notation is when I want to sum up all of the boxes within here, um, if we take the limit of those boxes, it's really just our triple integral over our density function. Um, with respect to each of the variables, d, z, d, y, d, x, um, where these bounds are going to be the bounds that trace out this shape in three-dimensional space. So one of our goals is to be able to come up with the bounds to be able to trace out three-dimensional shapes. And the other goal is to be able to actually compute the integral once we've set up the bounds. The hard part is finding the bounds. Um, but notice how this differs so this is finding mass. Notice how this differs from what we talked about previously. Previously, we just talked about finding volume. So volume for double integrals, in that case, we were talking about an integral where x had some bounds, where y had some bounds, and then we had some function that was just a function of x and y's which was actually equal to our height, right, dy, dx. So here is our base. Our bounds gave the base, and the function gives the height. In this case, our z values are being used to trace out the region, and our function is telling us the density instead. So this function is telling us the density. But we can use Vol, uh, triple integrals to be able to compute volume. So what would that look like? A volume using triple integrals. Well, a volume using triple integrals, it would mean that I would want to sum up all of the boxes inside of this, but instead of computing how much each of the tiny little boxes weigh, Really, we would just need to know the volume of each of these little boxes, and then we add up all of the boxes. And one way to think about that is to think of it as a density function of 1. Namely, if I look at an integral where x has a bound, y has a bound, z has a bound over this type of region, but I'm integrating over the function 1, dz, dy, dx, this will give me the volume. Why does having a 1 in here give me the volume? You can see it two different ways. One way is to think about adding up all of the little boxes where all of them have a density of 1. So instead of getting the mass of the object, you'll just get the volume because it's a constant density throughout the entire object. Algebraically, you'll see that when you actually evaluate these integrals, if our z values are going from 0 to some height, my first step in integration is actually just throwing z into the function, which is the same thing as what we did 
down here. So that's my look into theory. Now I'm going to do a bunch of different examples, and we're going to start with a rectangular box and Fubini's theorem is going to be our first example. So let's say that I wanted to do a triple integral over a box. So I'm integrating over my three-dimensional region, and I have a three-variable function, 2xy plus c. So this is like my density function. How do I set up this integral? The first set of bounds are the bounds on x, the next set of bounds are the bounds on y, and the final set of bounds are the bounds on z. And what Fubini's theorem tells us, when I'm integrating over rectangles in 2D, or over boxes in 3D, that the order doesn't really matter. I can interchange the order of integration, and as long as I have my outer bounds matching my dx, dy, dz bounds, I can integrate in whatever order I want. So I could integrate this function having my x's on the outside going from 0 to 2, my y's next going from 0 to 1, and my z's last going from negative 1 to 1 over this function 2xy plus z dz dy dx. Or, I'm, and here I'm making sure that my innermost integral matches the next, the variable with respect I'm doing the integration. And notice that this inner function, this doesn't change. If I wanted to reorganize these bounds, I could put my y on the inside and my y values. The bounds aren't changing because they're just these fixed constant bounds. So my y's go from 0 to 1. My, let's say maybe we want to do x's next. So my x's go from 0 to 2. And my z's go from negative 1 to 1. Notice that my inner function doesn't change. This is my density function. The density didn't change when I think about taking my uh, uh, bounds in different orders. But what does change is that my y integration has to come first, my x integration has to come second, and my z integration has to come next. This is the last thing I'm doing in this tape, so if you don't want to see this integration, then you can skip on. However, if you'd like to have a little more practice doing integration, I'm going to go ahead and integrate this function. So when I integrate with respect to y, I'm treating both x and z as constants. And the integral of y is going to be 1 half y squared. So when I raise y to a squared power, I end up with xy squared, and the 2 goes away, plus z times y. And I'm evaluating this as y goes from 0 to 1. Don't forget that I have these integrals on the outside. I'm going to shorthand not write it all out. I plug in y equals 1 and y equals 0. When y equals 1, I'm left with just x plus z. And when y equals 0, all of this goes away. So it means my integral actually looks a lot simpler now. As x goes from 0 to 2, dx dz, as z goes from negative 1 to 1. This is a step that's easy to forget, that sometimes you just plug in the bounds, but you need to remember that this is an integral, so my innermost integral I'm going to integrate again. x, The integral of x is going to be 1 half x squared. z I'm treating as a constant, so I just leave it out front, and this becomes z times x, evaluated from x equals 0 to 2. Don't forget that I have this outermost z integral still. Now when I integrate x equals 0 to 2, plugging 2 in, 2 squared is 4 divided by 2 is 2, plus z times 2, 2z, minus 0, because plugging in x equals 0 makes both those terms 0. And I need another sheet of paper because I'm running out of space. So finally, I ha still have to integrate as z goes from negative 1 to 1 of dz. And my final piece here, when I integrate, whoops, I bumped my camera. When I integrate with respect to z, this is just boring regular integration, I get 2z 
plus 1 half times 2z squared becomes z squared. And I evaluate that as z goes from negative 1 to 1. Plugging 1 in, I get 2 plus 1 squared, which is 1. And I get, plugging negative 1 in, I get negative 2 plus negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, positive 1, and I end up with 2 plus 1 plus 1, which is equal to 4. And we're done.